postdoc with zero salary or whatever. <laughs> so working with Michaela Biasuri at Lamont of Columbia University. And I just started my fellowship from December, including the, you know, the government shutdown period. So <laughs> <laughs> technically, I've been here for uh, three months so far. And I did my PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Professor Larissa Beck. And then before joining here, I was doing a postdoc at the GFDL Princeton. And then I was mainly focusing on uh, tropical weather, uh, tropical wave phenomena, including MJL and those kind of things. Uh, what else? Should I talk? <laughs> That's all. <laughs> did you run the? Did you run GFDL's model, or you worked with one of their models? I know they have. A yes, uh, I was running uh, the latest version of the GFDL model. It's yeah. called the CM4, uh -huh. and then I believe. It's still not published yet. No. It is? Okay, I'm, See, gonna, gonna I'm gonna take that back, maybe only AM. AM for, yeah, for, yeah oh. right. So the, I'm pretty sure the atmospheric component was frozen, but the, they are still working on the, the coupling part. And then I believe the, the CM4 was published. So you, you were running it in coupled mode? or? Yeah, coupled mode. Nice, so and you analyzed the results? Uh, and so analyzed the result, yeah. So the, the nice thing is it has an MGO. Uh -huh. It's good. And then, plus it has, uh, like, mean climate tools is kind of good because it's well-tuned. And so that is kind of good part. But, uh, there's still a lot of, like, uh, process what's going on. What is it? Is that one? The, so it's a, what's the resolution? It's, it's pretty high. Uh, quarter degree? I think the quarter degree. Well, the atmospheric component. That's if I really. Yeah, it, it, it's at least uh, less than one one degree. Point five degree, or yeah, I think point five degree could be that. Mm -hmm. Do you know whether that model makes tropical cyclones? Uh, that could be because uh, Ming Zhao always had his own <coughs> Hiram model that, that did great on making tropical cyclones. Exactly. So like that is kind of tricky part in the GFDL. Like uh, if you want to study the tropical cyclone, you have to use different version of the model. And then for this kind of CM4, like uh, we tend to, you know, not use that model for the main purpose. So like the people for you, you know, doing the tropical cyclone stuff is using a different model mm -hmm. and the CM4. Like that, we are trying to kind of merge everything together yeah. in a unified model. But the, right now, I talk to the people there, and then it seems like a tropical cyclone in that unified model is not super good. Mm -hmm. But we we are not you know, sure why. Maybe the like parameterization of convection could be a problem. Nice. Thanks. Okay, so that's the introduction. Okay, so. Uh, thanks, Clara, for organizing this, and then thanks, thank you guys for coming here. Again, I'm a new NPP here, and this is my first talk here, and today I'm going to talk about uh, what I have done as kind of side project with the, a lot of collaborators, the Angel Adams at the University of Michigan, and then Kazuya Snaga at Toyama University. And in this talk, I'm going to look at the tropical waves, and then I want to i show you a new diagnostic application of the Fourier analysis for looking at the vertical velocity profiles in the convectively coupled equatorial waves and then also the Mendelian oscillation. So I want to propose a new diagnostic framework to understand the mechanism of, of those. First of all, why should we care about tropical waves? <coughs> this is a snapshot of the infrared image from the geostationary satellite and uh, infrared image represents the cloudiness in the atmosphere. If you look at the tropics, you can see that a lot of clouds are organized as a clusters, like here. And then, in fact, a significant fraction of the tropical, the precipitation variability is explained by those kind of cluster of the clouds. And in a lot of cases, those clusters are organized as a part of the tropical waves. Therefore, we need to understand the dynamics of this wave to understand this kind of cluster of the clouds. And for instance, like you can see 
the train of the clusters here in the East and Pacific, and then I'm sure these clusters are organized by the tropical waves, especially, uh, more specifically, this should be the westward inertia gravity wave based on the structure and the size. And uh, you can see also here is another cluster here and a cluster here. This is a canonical structure of the equatorial Rossby wave. So I would say almost every cluster is a wave, actually. This is another snapshot of the infrared image of the Indian Ocean. It's India in the Arabian Sea, and you can see the gigantic cluster of clouds. And then this cluster almost spanning the entire oceanic basin of the Indian Oceans. And then this gigantic cluster is called the Manjulian Oscillation, or the MJO. And then this is one kind of the wave phenomena in the tropics. And then this is one of the most important tropical variability. For instance, MJO is linked to the frequency and the location of the tropical cyclones. In this figure, uh, they plotted as a colored contour, the velocity potential at 200 hectopascal, and then occurrence of the tropical cyclone as a red circle. And you can think this greenish color as just an active phase of the MJO, and the brownish color represents an inactive phase of the MJO. So you can see that the occurrence of the tropical cyclone is very concentrated within the active phase of the MJO. And as the MJO propagates to the east, the, this, the tropical cyclogenesis place is also propagated to the east. Therefore, we can say that the phase of the MGO plays very crucial role in the tropical cyclogenesis. And we also know that MGO is highly linked to the, the extreme weather in the United States. For instance, this is a snapshot of the precipitable water, the column integrated water vapor. And MGO often expels the moisture plume into the mid latitude, and that plume always uh, sometimes reach to the west coast of the United States, making this kind of pathway of the moisture, which is called the atmospheric river. And then this atmospheric river cause the heavy precipitation and then sometimes floods in the west coast of the United States. And MJO is actually the source of this kind of atmospheric river. It is also well known that MJO modulates the variability and onsets on the global monsoon system. And this schematic figure shows the summarization of the influence of the MGO in the global uh, weather and then climate system. In uh, the green area here, the Central America and the Southeastern Asia, in the boreal summer, MGO change the moisture condition here. So it modulates wet, dry conditions. And in the blue area here, the South America, uh, no, the, it's a border of Mexico and America, and then this is the Africa and Asia monsoon regions, the MJO modulates the amplitude and the timing of the, uh, the monsoon system. And then also, as I talked before, in this the reddish color here, the MJO change the tropical cyclogenesis. And not only the MJO, but the other type of waves are also linked to the tropical cyclogenesis. For instance, this is a snapshot of the colored infrared image. This is the equator. Again, this is uh, over the Indian Ocean. And then you can see the cloud clusters here and then here. And then this already looked like the tropical cyclone. And then actually, this is a signal of the equatorial Rossby wave. This is a very canonical structure of the equatorial Rossby wave. And then this cluster eventually evolved into a tropical cyclone. So this illustrates that the equatorial Rossby wave or the tropical waves is actually the source of the tropical cyclone. And more interestingly, MJO and then the other type of the waves are interwoven very highly. This is uh, the schematic from the well-known, uh, very famous paper in Nakazawa 1988. So in this schematic, what he shows is that if you look into the details here, look into the detail, zoom in, then each cloud cluster depicted at this circle is going moving to the west. So each circle is propagating to the west. By the way, this is not a single cloud. This is already the cluster of the multiple clouds. So the length is like 100 kilometer scales. Okay, so this, the cloud cluster, each cluster is moving to the west. 
but if you zoom out a little bit, then now each cluster consists of this kind of line. This is called a supercluster. This is a cluster of clusters. <coughs> and then this supercluster moves to the east. So this propagates to the east. And if you zoom out further, then the multiple superclusters depicted at these multiple lines makes this kind of huge envelope here. And then this is actually the MJO. And then so that we can say that the MJO is composed of the super the multiple superclusters. Therefore, like uh, if you want to think about the details of the MJO, we cannot separate this kind of way because this the this kind of supercluster. By the way, this supercluster is actually the Kelvin wave. Therefore, like uh, we cannot separate the Kelvin wave the MJO because the Kelvin wave is actually the building blocks of this MJO. And then. Very recently, the Kikuchi et al. 2018 shows that in the Dynamo field campaign, uh, MJO, there are a couple of uh, MJOs happening in the Dynamo field campaign. And then by using the wavelet analysis, they actually show that, the, that those MJO in the Dynamo field campaign are com composed of slowly propagating Kelvin wave. Therefore, they like uh, using the observational evidence that the slowly propagating Kelvin wave is actually the building blocks of the MJO. Could you, should, you mentioned that um, you know the waves cause you know the, the the precipitation, right? Should we be thinking of that as a one-way thing, like you know if there's a wave and it's dry, you know, or, or should we be thinking of it as potentially a two-way thing or an unknown or? It's it's <laughs> very interactive. Like uh, so, of course, the wave is interactive. The clouds within the wave, okay. and then. Uh, so we should be thinking of it as kind of a two-way thing. Yeah, two-way so thing. So does yeah. that imply then that the convection is also influencing the wave? Yeah, complex, Yeah, exactly. Okay. So convection is influencing the waves, and then also the, the wave also influencing the wave. And okay. the, yeah. The and convection. that's true for all of the waves that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So at least okay. uh, like uh, all these kind of tropical waves, yeah, okay. we have this kind of interaction. You oh. can get the, the other kinds of tropical waves in a dry atmosphere, but the particular propagation characteristics of the waves will be influenced by exactly. clouds and convection. Yeah. So if you can like make the atmosphere <coughs> completely dry, then we can have this kind of waves, but the propagation speed is completely different and then yeah. like so this is very specifically just the speed or the amplitude? <coughs> I don't know about the amplitude. Uh -huh. Just a, okay. at least this a speed. Okay. It's different. So we have MJOs as well? There is no MJO in the ah no that's I that's know actually the point, right? <laughs> that you get these slow right. things when the convection couples. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know one yeah. guy who said that, like, he ran a dry model, and then he he said that that is like a, there is a signal of the MGO in his dry model. Uh, really? Yes. Huh. <laughs> but it wasn't in wasn't in what Matsuno published back in nineteen sixty six or whatever. Yeah, right. like the the, the, right. is, uh, the, the yeah. I forgot the name. Uh, oh. Chuturik. Then uh, the guy who was working with Brian Mapes and then uh, he's in the Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. But I haven't seen his publication. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw in, uh, in uh, the talk. But, uh, Interesting. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of like the main motivation why we should you know, care about the tropical waves because the tropical wave explains a lot of tropical like precipitation variability and then it's also linked to the highly <laughs> high impact weather and climate phenomena and then also those two MGO and then a lot of different type of waves are interwoven. But uh, nevertheless, like uh, in spite of its importance, it's notoriously difficult to simulate those waves correctly in a GCM. And then this is the main reason why we should care about the tropical waves. And is, is there a leading reason for why it's so challenging? No idea. Like uh, so, like uh, I, I think like the main reason could be the convective parameterization. But okay. the, there are a lot of like intercomparison project, and then they use like a different kind of you know, convective parameterizations, uh, you know. And okay. but uh, they all you know already shows that uh, still the waves are missing. <coughs> and we can tune like some parameter to enhance uh -huh. very specific right. type of wave, but uh, it deteriorates everything. So then, therefore, a global cloud resolving model gets them all. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, like, like if if the like a mean climatology is kind of correct in a global cloud resolving model, mm -hmm. should be 
good, but the, at least the night the Nikon, the yeah. Japanese yeah, highest yeah. the model, the 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 motivation is that right, like uh, running the glass plasma yeah. model to simulate those kind of thing, and then what they found is like uh, they screwed up the quantum topology completely. So uh, it's hard to tune one of those. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a question about that though, because yep. hasn't Dayun done some kind of work showing that those models that tend to produce those characteristics of the MJO that are desirable also tend to exacerbate underlying climatological biases. So there's somewhat of a tension between the two. Uh -huh. So it's not obvious a priori to me that the better the climatology, the better the MJO. Yeah. But sometimes uh, they work. Right, exactly, right. And then that is kind of like a trade off usually people talking about. Like Dehin Kim is talking about, like, if you. If you want to have the nice MJO, usually you have to deteriorate the mean climatology. And he, and he should, he, that's pretty robust. It's pretty robust, right? yeah, right. But the, the one that's very specific way, if you turn the like, entrainment parameter, uh -huh. then you have the enhanced MJO, but it usually deteriorates the you know, mean precipitation completely, like screwed up. Hmm. So, so that is like, that is why. Like the, we want to have the nice climatology first because that's the highest priority. But at the same time, we want to you know simulate this kind of variability. So we want to have this kind of waves, but uh, we don't know how to do that. Okay, so this is the main motivation of this study. Again, like GCM has difficulty in simulating the tropical wave phenomena. However, at the same time, like there have been so many theoretical papers. Like since mm -hmm. like if you trace back to the 1960s, Jules Cherny's the original paper, or well you can trace back to the you know, 16th century's Laplace original paper, and then since then, like there's dozens of theoretical papers, but the, still we don't know how we can like extract the meaningful physics from the theory in such a way that we can apply that kind of theory to the GCM to modify that. Therefore, like uh, in this project, we want to first of all, as a first step, uh, we want to propose a new like common diagnostic framework which could be applicable both to the theory and then GCM results so that like we want to compare the theory and GCM to extract some kind of like a meaningful physics from the theory that is the main motivation of this project and for those who are not familiar with the wave diagnostics I can quickly go over how we can extract the wave signal tropical wave signals people usually do and I'm gonna quickly explain how to read and make so-called the wheeler Pilates diagram. And if you are familiar with this kind of concept, maybe this is kind of good timing for check your email or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, we can categorize the wave, wave structure into two ways. The symmetric type of wave and anti-symmetric type of wave about the equator. And then this is the example. This is the example of the symmetric type of wave you can see the cloud cluster here and then here located around the equator in a symmetric way. Yeah. That, that pointer is not working. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Green plus like a oh, yellow. Oh, Oh, you're right. Thanks. Oh, yeah, okay. Exactly. Okay, this is, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> this classic one, yeah. So, <laughs> so we have like a twin vortices here. This is located in a, like a equator, the, the symmetric around the equator, and then this is a symmetric type of wave, and then this is anti-symmetric type of wave. You have the cluster here, and an open space here, and a cluster here, and an open space here. So this is aligned in anti-symmetric way. So first of all, we need to decompose the time series into the symmetric component and anti-symmetric component. That is the step one for the wheeler Pilates diagram. And then for the each symmetric component and anti-symmetric component, we're gonna take the two-dimensional Fourier transformation. And then now the time series as a function of zonal wave num uh, zonal uh, no, longitude x and then t time t is converted to the Fourier trans the Fourier coefficient, capital A, as a function of zonal wave number k and the temporal frequency n. And uh, usually people plot this a square as a function of zonal wave number and a temporal frequency. And then this is called the power spectrum. And then this is an example of the power spectrum of the cloudiness data for the anti-symmetric component and the symmetric component. And then in this plot, the x-axis is a zonal wave number. This is a positive here, and then this is a negative here. And 
as you go outside the <coughs> absolute value of the zonal wave number increase, that means the spatial scale becomes smaller and smaller. And the y-axis here is a temporal scale. It's a frequency. As it goes up, it becomes like the frequency becomes going up. Therefore, the temporal scale becomes shorter and shorter, or periodicity becomes shorter. Um, can you explain, Kuni? Is this? Are you operating on an Eulerian grid plane, or are you operating? And also, is it? Have you collapsed everything, or is it? Is this just like to be considered as values on an equator where you have symmetric and anti-symmetric? So what we power do, or the, what we do is first of all, like at each la the latitude, uh -huh. we have the x and the time time series, right? For the and you need the whole whole yeah we need the whole entire okay from zero to three hundred sixty okay okay yeah. got it so this is at a latitude band yeah at latitude band and then the finally what we're gonna do is average out all latitude from the minus fifteen degree to fifteen degree so averaging by latitude and then uh, wait w at which point do you average by latitude before you decompose or after after okay so first so of all first we you need to decompose. Um, distinguish between symmetric and anti-symmetric about the equator, right? Ex exactly, exactly, yeah. And so, and so like, uh, technically, like, uh, if you average everything, it's going to be a symmetric component, right? Because it's, if it, it's just adding up everything. And before you, de before you do the yeah. Fourier transformation. Yeah. Okay, yeah. If, and then if you do, like, uh, average the northern hemisphere, Average in the southern hemisphere, subtract each other, then this is anti symmetric. Component. Okay, okay, yeah, got yeah it. something okay. like that. Okay. But yeah, like and this is completely linear, so like uh, you can. And you're operating on OLR? What do you OLR, this yeah. is OLR. And then this is also the, uh, we have the same kind of pattern if you use the precipitation. Okay, and now the more like the important thing is that in this diagram, the positive zonal wave number corresponds to the eastward propagating signal. And the negative zonal wave number corresponds to the westward propagating signal. So, by looking at this uh, figure, you can see that the structure of the zonal wave number frequency and then plus the wave signal is moving to the west or moving to the east. And this, the raw power spectrum, is good. Like, like it's kind of enough because you can see a lot of you know, signatures here in a symmetric component. By the way, this is a Kelvin wave. And you can see the strong signal here, this is the MJO, but the usually people add one more step. This is because this, the raw power spectrum includes the wave signal and also the background noise. So what we're gonna do is just remove in, removing the background noise from those figures. And I'm not gonna explain how to estimate the background noise because it's still very controversy. So, but the, somehow we can remove the background noise and then it looks like this. Okay, so you want to compare like those two. This is the signal, and then this is the row. This is the signal. What is the, what are the units of the y-axis? This is a unit less, because uh, the background noise has uh, the, the y-axis. Frequency. 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 Oh yeah, frequency. Oh, frequency. Oh, frequency. Okay. He's got he's got period on the right. Yeah. Oh yeah, right. Period in the right. So here is a three three oh, day. Right. Okay. Here is a six okay. day, and then this is a fifty day. Does that um that westward component? consists of the westward propagating components within the MJO that you were talking about. So it's moving eastward, but then you have those westward. Which one you were talking about? You, those individual clusters that are propagating westward within the MJO that you referred to before. Can you see that there on that spectrum? I think that is like mainly sheer, exactly. westward mm -hmm. natural gravity. Because the time scale goes like a day or something. E yeah, 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 okay. exactly. Yeah. So like the here is a three days and then here is like a point four. So like it's a two day time scale. So yeah. where is the MJO on this? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. <coughs> and the, the mean background wind translating things east-west, is, is it just not so a large enough effect to care about? That is a very tricky thing. And then, like, uh, some people did uh, this kind of analysis for, like, beating each the background wind direction and the background wind strength. And then they found that they modulate this kind of pattern a lot. So this is, you can think, like, uh, this is very long climatology. I'm looking at the 20 years of the OLR data, so which includes a lot of like a westerly phase, easterly phase, all those kind of thing, but the everything is smeared out. And then you can see this. But if you look at like a like the westerly phase, then maybe you know this looks like more this or something like that. It should be hard to 
Could you remind us which waves each of these are? On the accent anti-symmetric, maybe you're getting that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> here we go. Yeah. So the symmetric component, we have the MJO here. Zonal wave number one to four-ish, and then periodicity is 50J. And we have the Kelvin wave signal here along this line. And then this is the equatorial Rasby wave. This is called the tropical depression. And then this is called the westward inertia gravity wave. And then for the anti-symmetric component, this wave is called the eastward inertia gravity wave. And then this is called the mixed Rasby gravity wave. And you don't have to remember those names in this talk. But what that are the green spots on the right? Uh, the this is the satellite like uh, frequency. Oh, okay. So this is the signal of the satellite. <coughs> And then we, we know, like, uh, we, we should mask out this one because this is completely artificial. And then, but it's kind of interesting, like, if you look at the ear range drum, like, you can see this kind of signal. <laughs> so slightly assimilated. What, what do you mean by satellite signal? <laughs> so this is a satellite, and a satellite has, a, like, a periodicity itself, right? Yes. And then that, it, that makes that's this kind of, like, a peak here. And then that is completely, it's I not a... I guess I don't understand what's like causing the artifact. Aliasing or something? It's like aliasing, yeah, exactly. Is it, yeah. is it a peak frequency or something like that? Is it 14 orbits per day? Uh, with the, yes, the, this frequency is a cycle per day. So this is a, So I think this frequency I corresponds to the, the period nice. when the satellite is coming back to the original place or something uh, like that. And if you look at the year, it, yeah, it repeats, yeah. Times, yeah. yeah. So, and then if you went up to um, <coughs> frequency uh -huh. one, you'd have some big Hawking signal from just diurnal. Yes, exactly. So if you look at the one, like <coughs> it's, it's very crazy diurnal mm -hmm. cycle appears here, but uh, usually people ignore that because it's too noisy. Okay, and then the, the most difficult part is that the each species the, each different type of waves are controlled by the different mechanisms and, and that's why we are so struggling with modifying GCM. You know, you can tune the one parameter to enhance, for instance, the MJL, but it usually deteriorates the Kelvin wave and the other type of waves. And uh, I have never seen the single GCM which has all type of wave in this way. So, oh, and then people usually only looking at the symmetric component, so a lot of paper showing just symmetric component, but I'm pretty sure like a lot of model missing, completely missing this anti-symmetric component waves. So. Can you get these on an aqua planet? No. Uh, I would say aqua planet, maybe, if why wouldn't you be able to get one on planet? Because like uh, like some people think like the MGL is due to oh like so you have to like uh, make the zonal asymmetry somehow right. to make the MGL. But like other people say that we it appears on the symmetric side though. Zonal. No, zonal. zonal oh, I see. But like some model says like we don't need the zonal asymmetry, but it depends on the model. Is it like? You can basically get, I mean, like Tony talked earlier about these equatorial wave studies back in the 60s, and uh -huh. the point is if you change the equivalent depth because of like heating or something, it would change the stratification. You know, the point is then you start getting, you get MJO solutions. But it seems like all that analysis assumes that you have a, you know, that you have a basic state that's uniform in, in longitude. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so that is a basic assumption. You need, so it seems like like these are free modes. Like you can get a, like a, an MJO is a free mode. Mm -hmm. In an aqua planet, even if you don't have a, a zonal asymmetry, uh, you don't have a zonal asymmetry in temperature, for example. Right. So if the MGO is completely like that kind of free mode, then we have to have like MGO in aqua planet simulation. Right. Like, but how? Like, to get MGO started, you gotta get organized convection. But if you just have like an aqua planet, don't you just have like a band wrapping around where the sea surface temperature is pretty much the same? Like, well, well, Jeff has an aqua planet version of. Model. Too, we could, you know, could, we could, we could run yeah. versions of the GCM that make an MJO with an aqua planet and see whether one pops right. up or not. So yeah, it depends. It depends on the model. I want to say that yeah. is kind of yeah. easy. People must have looked at this a little bit, though, right? I know. 
I'm thinking that people must have done it, but I'm hard pressed to think of a paper that yeah, I, could, I, mean, that I could point anything to. Diane, we're showing past climates and seeing if those different continental configurations have NJOs, and as far as I know, we're the only people who have Because most models that didn't until recently have a decent enough NJO to start playing around with. So we fairly we frequently hear it said that the anti-symmetric is more challenging for GCMs. But what is the reason why it's more challenging? I I don't know. I like to be honest. Like I I don't see any paper which focusing on the anti-symmetric component of the weight because a lot of people are interested in the MGL. So like a lot of people just omit this figure. Right. Right. Well, look at look at the amplitudes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, involved, and it's like when you're not getting when you're not getting the single it's biggest like, signal right, right, right. on this on this whole diagram. Then you say, well, job one is to try to get that, and then then the Kelvin wave is a big enough thing that you, you as you say, you know, you don't want to trade off too much so that you get all MJO and then Kelvin and vice exactly and yeah. vice versa. And people people had a hard enough time just doing that part. That says, yeah, we'll get to the anti-symmetric part someday. <laughs> so yeah, in general, like this is much smaller. And I've never better. heard anybody try to explain. Yeah, why, why that's there and why why GCMs have such a problem? Exactly, and the thing is, like a lot of paper about like uh, the George Pilates did a very good job, like looking at the this wave versus <coughs> the tropical cyclogenesis paper, and uh, they say like uh, it has a very strong connection between this and, and tropical cyclogenesis. So, in order to get the tropical cyclone correctly, like we need to get these patterns. But uh, or if we got better cyclones, we would get that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, chicken and egg. Chicken and yeah, it's chicken and egg. So I really appreciate you doing this because I've never studied any of this and no one ever walks us through it, so I, I really appreciate it. So now it makes me wonder though, it's like now a really stupid question. So the MJO is on the symmetric. Does that mean when this one's going up, there's another, I mean, there's not one going in the southern hemisphere the other way. Well, like it's, it's like it has a different name. It's, it's called the boreal summer, the interseasonal oscillation, so BSISO is what people call. So like uh, that means like a starting from the Indian Oceans, mm -hmm. but the gradually going to the north. And yeah, that presumably you definitely would not get on that planet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, right. because that is the monsoon. Exactly, so that is kind of interaction with the monsoon. But that usually like MGO is more dominant in uh, the boreal winter when the ITCC is kind of symmetric. Or like, and, but the, in the boreal summer, like uh, it tends to go to the north, like a uh, propagate starting from the Indian Ocean and gradually going to the up. But the, to be honest, like uh, I have no idea what the BSISO is actually, because like uh, there is still like a lot of people trying to define what's the BSISO. And then, for instance, the one guy in uh, Colombia, uh, you know, said, write a paper saying that there's a lot of different flavor of the BSISO and if you look at the structure it's completely different so like that we don't have like a single BSISO mm -hmm. so so, yeah, so, so there that is something propagating that's mirror I mean I, it's not a mirror though I mean so I don't understand what makes it symmetric if there's I thought symmetric the it's, whole idea it's the highest amplitude on the equator and decays away from the equator and so decays it's, away it's moving from essentially you know through the equatorial region and amplitude is decaying on either side, north and south. Whereas the anti-symmetric mode, you got like a Rossby wave on this right, side, right, and, yeah. and something else on that side. Yeah, yeah, right. I see. And there so you've really got actually a mirror image thing. Oh, okay. So so it's which is why, like in that satellite image that mm -hmm. that you showed, that you have these the, the clouds are coming in the low pressure areas, but the low pressure areas are staggered. But north, so it's not so much south. that there's a mirror image as that half of it is actually on the other side. Yeah, of yeah, it. yeah, okay. yeah. That, that helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a maximum. Yeah. So, you know, this kind of analysis is very arbitrary. <laughs> so, just one more question. Is this pretty barotropic or? Like no. Barotropic? So, that is kind of like uh, what I'm going to show today. <coughs> so, it's, it's pretty baloclinic. And then that baloclinicity is one of the most important parameters. Okay. So, well, you don't have to remember all of the like name, but the, you want to like know those waves can be categorized into the two different groups. One is a divergent type of group, and then the other is a rotational type of waves. And then the divergent type of wave is kind of gravity wave. And if you have the divergence, and then you have the, com you know, the convergence, divergence happens, and then this is a propagating. And then rotational type of wave is kind of interacted with the potential vorticity. So you can see that, and then that is shown in a different color. MJO 
and then equatorial Rasby wave, tropical depression, look like the rotational type of wave. So that means like a rotation, the vorticity plays the most important role in the dynamics. On the other hand, the Kelvin wave and then westward inertia gravity wave, eastward inertia gravity wave, those are gravity wave actually, are more divergent type of wave. And then here, I show the purple because it's a mixed Rasby gravity wave and the name stands for what I mean. Like it's kind of mixture of the Rasby wave and the gravity wave. So it has a both kind of structure. But I want to say like this wave is more close to the divergent type of wave. So we, you, we have like a two type of wave, divergent type and rotational type of wave. And then we want to look at like a different structure of the vertical velocity profile among different, you know, uh, different type of waves. And then more specifically, I want to comp I want to estimate like some kind of characteristic quantity which represents this vertical velocity profile in this the Fourier space. Therefore, like we can directly compare. Hey, MGL has this kind of quantity, and then the Kelvin wave has this kind of quantity. So comparing to those two, and then like this has more you know some specific pro you know property about the vertical velocity profile or something like that. Okay. So now I want to look at the vertical velocity profile structure, but why we should look at the vertical velocity profile? Because at least as I, like, uh, to my knowledge, like a vertical velocity profile is the most important parameter or the most important variable for this kind of wave dynamics. And then there have been a lot of wave dynamics paper. The first group belonged to the theory about the divergent type of wave, and the second group belonged to kind of MJL mechanism group, uh, the paper. And in all of paper, like the vertical, vertical velocity is the most important key parameter. And but the, in those kind of paper, like there are two important properties about the omega profile. One is the tilt how much tilting structure we have as it evolves from like shallow to deep convection. So this is kind of temporal evolution pattern, tilting structure. And the top heaviness is specifically, I'm talking about at the center of the convection. So if the convection is maximized, how much the, convec the omega profile looks the top heavy. So this is very related to the like a fraction of the stratiform class or, and then the first one is talking about like a transition from the shallow to the deep cumulus. And the second one is talking about the, at the center of the convection, what is a fraction of the stratiform clouds, or what is the amount of the ice or something like that. And then those two properties are very important. And then those properties are kind of parameterized in a very crude way in every model. This is the uh, illustration of the tilting structure. This is from my dissertation work. The y-axis is the height, the altitude, the hectopascal. And then I just compare the two different time scales of the omega profile transition. The colored contour is the omega profile. This is a two-day time scale. This is a four-day time scale. So you can start from the minus one lag day to one lag day of composite. This is a minus two lag day to two lag day composite. You can see that in both of the time scales, you can see a lot of tilting structure of the omega profile. The bl blue color means the uh, upward motion. So you start from the shallow cumulus here, and then eventually go to the stratiform class. Go ahead. How do you get the data for these? You know, kind of uh, omega is famously unobservable. <laughs> uh, this is a toga for field campaign data. So okay. the first of all, like you have the precipitation, and then you have the sounding data, and then the variation analysis to yeah. constrain the omega profile. Isn't that so basically a sounding array. Sounding array, yeah, exactly. This sound and, and I guess surface rainfall. Mm. Yeah. And the okay, yeah, so and then so you have the both tilting structure. And this kind of tilting structure is very ubiquitous among the different time scales because we have the two completely different time scales. This is a two-day scale and a four four day scale, but the, we have the same kind of amount of tilting structure. And then this structure is observed in various time scale and the temporal uh, the spatial scale. And then this was pointed out by Brian Mapes. And this actually the amount of this kind of tilt is the one of the key for setting the phase velocity and also the instability of the each specific waves. 
especially for the Kelvin wave or inertial gravity wave, this tilting structure should be the key parameter. And then that is discussed in those kind of theoretical paper. And now I want to talk about the top heaviness. By the top, the ter terminology top heaviness, I'm specifically talking about the top heaviness at the convective center. So when the convection is maximized here. So like you want to compare the cross section here and then here. Can I have a question I don't know that is, do you know offhand if you can get a tilting structure um, without ice? I don't, uh, like, so I think that this structure, at least like uh, this part, the stratiform clouds, gonna missing. Yeah. But we can have the like shallow clouds, yeah, right? Yeah, I just wonder if it would always look, you know, I don't know if you can get it. I, maybe, I don't, maybe. I think like if you're if filled if with cold pools and maybe like evaporation, a lot of evaporation can start to drive divergence at the lower. What, what's the fraction of the ice in a stratiform clouds? Comparing to 100% the percent above the <laughs> <laughs> melting level. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if we completely missing those kind of stratiform clouds, then like okay. we definitely we're missing those kind of part. Okay, now I want to talk about how important the top heaviness and the bottom heaviness. Okay, first of all, the first panel shows that like that it's very typical moist static energy profile. We have the maximum in the lower troposphere and the upper troposphere, and then we have kind of this kind of C shape. And then now we want to compare two different omega profile shape. One has a bottom heavy shape, and then the other has a top heavy shape. Here, the maximum happens in the upper troposphere, and then here the, we have the upper, the maximum in the lower troposphere. And in this kind of bottom heavy system, can I ask a quick question? Can sure. You, sorry, just basic. But, but you know, I should know this. Why does moist static energy profile look like that? Is it? The, I mean, the bottom I'd say surface flexes. But, but yeah, the bottom but is the due top? to the moisture, and the okay. top is due to the the geo potential. I see. So this is adding those together. So the moisture profile look like this, and the dry static energy look like this, and if you add it together, so then. Uh -huh. Okay. That, that is kind of like asking why the moisture profile look like this kind of. Okay. <laughs> like my question is, and I, I have no idea. I think it's temperature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah well, like the you know, so, so even with, you know, you have a uniform temperature, you're still going to get a decrease in moisture. Yeah, 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 that's right. Mm. Oh, right. Okay, so in this kind of bottom heavy system, we have the convergence d omega dp happens here in the lower troposphere where the moist static energy is poor and uh, rich in the lower troposphere and then the, the convergence happens here and a divergence over here tend to happen in the here where the moist static energy is poor in the middle atmosphere therefore in this kind of system you import the moist static energy rich air from here export the moist static energy the poor air, therefore, in this system, net import of the moist static energy is happen. Therefore, as the convection happens with this kind of profile, you have the more import of the moist static energy. That enhances the further convection, and then that enhances the further import of the moist static energy. So that is kind of positive feedback between the convections and then also the moist static energy. And then on the other hand, uh, this kind of top heavy system, we have the opposite happens, like a uh, convergence happens where the moist static energy is poor, the divergence happens where the moist static energy is rich, therefore in this kind of a system, the moist static energy rich air is just exported out of the system, therefore in this system, net export of the moist static energy happens, and uh, which leads to the decay of the convection, therefore we can usually say that this kind of bottom heavy system is more unstable, and then we, this is you know, characterized by the quantity called the gross moist stability. And then this, co like, this corresponds to the negative gross moist stability. This corresponds to the positive gross moist stability. And then this kind of system is more stable. And a lot of theoretical studies speculates that this kind of bottom heavy system is very important for the MJO or rotational type of the wave dynamics. And then Juming Kwan specifically speculates that 
like that we should have the more bottom heavier profile in the MGL, temporal, and the spatial scale because if you know this kind of bottom heavy profile is the main reason for the instability of the MJL, then MJL will prefer this profile to this profile. But that nobody has checked this one. Okay, so so far I'm talking about the tilting structure and then also the top heaviness at the convective center. But the, those again are related to the cloud microphysics. This is you know talking about the transition from the shallow cumulus to the deep cumulus, and then this is talking about the you know at the convective center, the fraction of the stratiform clouds, or you know like the ice condensation. And now I w again again we have the rotational type and the divergent type of wave, and then in this in this plane, like we want to answer this question first of all, the how much of the tilt we have, like in different type of waves. And the second question we want to answer is how top heavy or bottom heavy omega profile is for each specific type of waves. And then do we have like a different like a structure? And then for analyzing those kind of things, like we have to define the quantity which represents the top heaviness and like and also the amount of the tilt. And then which is very uh, easily done using the EOF analysis. Usually, uh, this is the, the EOF structure. The EOF1 is showing this bluish color. EOF2 is showing this uh, reddish color. And in the deep tropics, we can approximate the omega profile as just a linear combination of the EOF1 and EOF2 because to two EOF explains almost like 90% of the total variance. And now we define this the constant tau, which is the Fourier transformation of the principal component to the ratio between the Fourier transformation of the principal component to this is the capital O2 to the Fourier transformation of the cap uh, of the principal component one, and then because both those two are Fourier transformation, therefore the tau is a complex number, and then I'm gonna show you later that the the real component of the tau represents how top heavy the omega profile is, and the imaginary component represents how the tilt, how much tilt we have. And I'm gonna demonstrate how it works. Like for this demonstration, I'm gonna just synthesize very artificial time series. So first of all, I define the principal component one in a very simple wave, you know, equations. This is just a wave with a zonal wave number one and temporal frequency one. And for this demonstration, I'm gonna specify this the imaginary number tau, and let's say like a imaginary real component of the tau is 0.3, and then the imaginary component is let's say the 0.2 or something like that. We we can specify, and then by definition we can compute the principal component the two as just a tau times the principal component one, and by using this EOF structure extracted from the, the ERA intra, we can reconstruct the omega profile like this. This is a real component of the linear combination of the principal component one and principal component two. <coughs> and this is how it looks like. If I specify the real component of the tau 0.3 and the imaginary component of this tau 0.2, the structure should look like this. And then now I want to reduce this uh, top heaviness ratio, the real component of this tau, to zero, what would happen? Just like this. Now we have the same amount of tilting structure because the tilt ratio is 0.2, but the, if, because I reduce the top heaviness ratio, therefore it becomes more kind of bottom heavy. And then um, in such a way, you can like uh, play with this kind of parameter. If you have if you decrease the tilt ratio to zero, there is no tilt, but we have the same amount of like uh, top heaviness here, top heaviness here, and then you can increase the tilt to the point four, and it looks like this. So therefore, like uh, this tau represents this kind of structure, and then we can kind of quantify the structure of the omega profile just using the tau. Like we can say like, hey, we have the real component of the tau is point four. So like the, if you compare the MJO and the Kelvin wave, and then we can say like, hey, MJO has 0.2 more tiltness than the MJO, uh, the Kelvin wave or other wave or something like that. So this is kind of basic concept. 
So we can quantitatively uh, assess the omega profile structure. And now we want to compute those. And that's pretty simple. Like we have the principal component two, principal component one. We're gonna take the Fourier transformations. And this is just a definition of the tau. This uh, like the free Fourier transformation of the O2 divided by the Fourier transformation of the O1. And this is just computed like this. So you can compute the principal component O2 free transformation times the conjugate of the O1 divided by the O1 times the conjugate of the O1. So you can see that like the, this is just a cross power between the principal component 2 and principal component 1 divided by the power spectrum of the principal component 1. And so like this tau represents how top heavy and how tilt mega profile has. And now again, like this question, how much tilt we have in a different type of wave. So we can plot it for those kind of different quantity in this plane. So this is kind of like a plot of the tilting, the tilt first, uh, tilt ratio. So this is the imaginary component of the tau. And for the anti-symmetric component, symmetric component, and the reddish color means more tilt. Mm -hmm. So we have like a Kelvin wave here, westward inertia gravity wave, and eastward inertia gravity wave here, more kind of divergent type of wave, has the strong tilt. But the, we don't have the tilt for the equatorial Rasby wave. Tropical depression may be a little bit small. The MJO is just a kind of continuous from the Kelvin wave to here. But the, comparing to the Kelvin wave, it definitely has less tilt. So it has like a, like the vertically kind of stuck structure and it propagates like this instead of like this kind of propagation. So this answer is a divergent type of wave has more tilt. And now we want to answer how top heavy or bottom heavy omega profile is. And then this is the answer. The reddish color means more top heavy profile, greenish color is a bottom heavy profile. So we have like a top heaviest profile in the MJL time scales here. So for the rotational type wave, the Gator Rasby wave, MJL, we have the top heaviest profile. Therefore, in that case, we say that the, those long time scale phenomena, maybe the stratiform clouds is the most dominant clouds comparing to the shallow clouds. And then you have as the time scale uh, gets shorter and shorter, go this direction, it becomes more bottom heavy. So the stratiform, the importance of the stratiform is kind of decreasing as the time scale gets shorter. And this is kind of like important property again, because those two quantities, the tilting structure and the top heaviness is like large scale quantity, but at the same time it's related to the cloud microphysics and then because we need to like uh, like parameterize the clouds in such a way that it has to be coupled with this kind of large scale conditions. Therefore, like uh, I, I don't know like the which is true. Like uh, in order to improve the cloud microphysics, we have to have the nice large scale environment, or in order to get the nice waves, we need to you know have the good cloud microphysics. But I don't know which is true. But that at least we need to kind of parameterize a cloud in, in this way. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering how this relates to like, energetic constraints because on uh, climatological time scales, you know, large space time scales, the deep tropics have to export energy, you know, they have to export moist static energy, which means that they have to be more top heavy. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems to me is the fact that the MJO is one of the largest sources of work or the, one of the largest scales of organization, the fact that it's top heavy related to that. Uh, so like, yeah, like the en energetic framework, we can think in that way, but at the same time, like, uh, how then MJO is destabilized. And then s a lot of people believe that MJO is destabilized because MJO has a bottom heaviest omega profile. That is completely opposite to... It seems like over the life cycle, you have to get more static energy out of the deep tropics. I, I feel like if they were, to, if it, you know, if you didn't have any ice and it were impossible to have something that's top heavy, you'd still get energy out of the tropics. Right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but so that implies yeah. that by extension, that means that if you were always bottom heavy, you'd still have to ultimately export. So I think that means the moist static energy profile would be different. <laughs> or the horizontal. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's hard to see how that would be. 
Right. I mean, but you would get energy out of the tropics, right? So, you know, that's a, those types of arguments where yeah, one says it has to be exported. I'm like, well, it's definitely going to be exported. <laughs> right, that's really conservation statement, right? I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not arguing. Yeah, yeah. Why do you keep on picking on microphysics? I mean, isn't the whole convective parameterization part of the at issue as well? Uh, I think, like, I think that also the convective parameterization part is also the issue. And then, like, the, my point is that uh, those two has to be interacted or, like, coupled in a kind of reasonable way. So, like, we know the condition when, like, uh, the shallow cumulus, you know, transit into the deep cumulus, but the, that condition has to be coupled with the large scale condition. And then there has to be coupled with this kind of wave. And then, well, like if you have the, like the single column model, then if you put in a implement that is in the large scale conditions, then what would happen? That is kind of like a different complexity of the stuff. So like, yeah, there's a lot of things like related to these things. So like, first of all, like convective parameterization itself is the most important part. Yeah. And then uh, at least this is a GFDL model, the latest version of the GFDL yeah. model, tilting structure. It's kind of okay. Can we see the obs again? Is it, uh, okay. Sorry, I should compare. Like, yeah, so like the reddish, uh -huh. it's, it's very red. It's very red here. Okay, uh -huh. And then, oops, yeah. So like it's kind of like, uh, it has some kind of structure, definitely. It has a like a, this kind of trend, but the like the amount of tilt is very missing here, and still like it's very challenging. And like again, this is kind of future project, and how we can modify the GCM is one of the like the important question to answer. And then what parameter is very important? And, like how can we extract from the theory to improve the GCM? And then also like I s need to look at the actually the cloud population and then in this plane so that like uh, like really it represents the like for instance the, like the population of the stratiform clouds or population of the shallow clouds or how they differ like in temporal scale or you know that kind of thing should be answered and then I, this is what I talked with uh, Greg L. Cesar, but unfortunately he had the doctor meeting today and then he couldn't make the train today so that's the email in the email, yeah, he told me that. But uh, yeah, this is kind of what I'm trying to work with him right now. So this is kind of summary. Okay. So how would you how would you couple the uh, how how would you affect such a thing? How top heavy the profile is? Because it seems like we can't resolve any of these circulation in GCMs, and so it's something that we in some ways you know, we basically you know we parameterize the mass flux or cumulus for parameterization, for example. And so I'm just wondering, like, you know, what how much control do we have over the uh, or, or, or well, yeah, how much control do we have over the vertical velocity profile mm -hmm. in the GCM, given that we're really you know, working directly with, with the uh, with the cumulus parameterization, and also other things like microphysics. Right, right. Yeah, but that's like at least like a tilting structure. Like that is like a lot of effort, which I'm sure like uh, Tony has been making here. Like that, including the downdraft or cold pool kind of thing, and then the memory of the uh, the <coughs> convections can improve that kind of tilting structure. And then a lot of people say that entrainment, you know, tuning the entrainment says that tuning the entrainment can enhance tilting structure. And about the top heaviness, uh, like. I know like some people do the analysis changing uh, the ice ice part in the, part of the crowd <coughs> microphysics to enhance the uh, latent heating in the upper troposphere that's kind of modulates the profile but, uh, but that is kind of tuning things instead of like a fundamental enhancement of the parameterization so I still don't know how like you know, clouds are interacted with the large scale condition in this way. All right. So you you associated top heavy with stable and bottom heavy with unstable. So in other words, does stable mean just propagating 
not amplifying and unstable means growing and not that not but I don't can can I just make maybe a small tweak to I think not stable versus unstable but but destabilizing versus stabilizing. Uh, yeah, right, yeah, right. T tendency. I think, yeah. yeah. But, like... Namely, converging waste static energy or diverging it. Exactly. Yeah. But, like, uh, so that is kind of a classic view. And then now, like, based on this study, I'm thinking that the top heavy is more unstable in such a way that even though top heavy profile exposes the moist static energy due to the circulations, but at the same time it enhances the, the greenhouse effect due to the, the stratiform clouds. And then maybe my speculation is that, that that kind of effect exceeds the this kind of stabilization effect due to the circulation. So if you have to compare two effects, the radiation and the circulations, and the people like the, in the previous study, people think like, hey, radiation we have we have constant, so we don't have like a, it is completely fixed. And then they try to tune this kind of circulation part, and then they say like, hey, bottom heavy now we have more stable, and then top heavy you know more stable or something like that. But the, this kind of view is talking about okay, we have like a stabilization effect due to this kind of circulation, but at the same time we have the stabilization or destabilization due to this like a uh, radiative effect. Which is literally a, a change from uh, of the moist static energy profile from time step to time step from radiative flux divergence and surface flux. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, um, it should be appeared in the It's always hard to think that. about that for me because that's happen it's happening in a Eulerian reference frame on some level and it's, if there is such a thing for a whole profile. That's yeah. I guess in the column wise sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the column column moist static energy moist sense. Yes, that's happened. So. But that is kind of. But like those are in addition. So you're saying those terms in addition to the literally the flux divergence from motions. Exactly. Exactly. Specifically. Yeah. Um, right. So what about advection? Ah, uh, you mean the horizontal advection? Yeah. I would say. <laughs> <laughs> that is very tricky part. I have no idea. It's, it's very, I'd say that is a random noise, but that it seems mm. like not random noise. Okay. Any more questions?